Yeah, this weekend we're in our Galatians series and it's weekend eight in a nine part series. So next weekend, Labor Day weekend, we'll close out this series. But as we kind of get to this weekend in the series, I wanted to say thank you so much for the encouragement and the feedback from so many. Uh, Twitter messages, iMessages, emails, handwritten cards. Thank you so much for the feedback. It is so encouraging to know that for all of us, us included, those that are presenting content, that God's Word doesn't return for it. And it's amazing to get that feedback to see how God is using it, not only in our lives, but in your lives too. So thank you for that encouragement. If you've missed much of the series and you've recently joined Mountain Springs, eight weekends are available on our mobile app, on our website. You can also get the free podcast that comes out every Monday. You can get that content. All right, by means of context, where is the Galatian letter in terms of all of history? So 30 years have elapsed now since the Apostle Paul has come to faith. He was dramatically converted on the off-ramp into Damascus, Syria, a town there in Syria, and he was dramatically encountered by God. God meets him, Jesus meets him, and there's this dramatic thing for three days where Paul's life is changed. He immediately has blindness. God replenishes or restores the sight, but with a whole new vision for his life. What happens was in those 30 years that have passed by, Paul became an apostolic machine. He was a church planting machine. And in those 30 years, he would go into a community. He would create a conversation around faith. He would raise up people, leaders, elders. He would plant a church and then he would go on to the next region and kind of replay it all over again. He was an apostolic church planting machine. Well, the way that he would oversee and shepherd these congregations is through his letters. We believe that perhaps there are 13 letters, one of which would be the Galatian letter, I believe possibly the first of the letters. He wrote this letter to really address what was going wrong in the church in Galatia. In South and Central Turkey, there were some rival missionaries that had come in and they were saying that God now limits His affections based upon our actions. Effectively, how we live determines how God feels about us. And Paul goes, that's not accurate, that's not true, that's heretical, we need to reset that. So the Galatian letter, if you're not familiar with it, is really kind of the abbreviated Roman letter where the Roman letter, he takes more time to unpack really the theology of his positions. In the Galatian letter, he just like shoots off the hip and brings the heat. So it's 149 verses is all that Galatians is, but it's so good. It's so rich. And I'd encourage you, find the time to go through that. Last weekend, we looked at the fullness of the Holy Spirit, how we can live with a fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Well, where last weekend, Paul's compelling arguments was towards walking in the Spirit. This weekend, the compelling argument to some degree is His how. His how you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray and then we'll jump into the content this weekend. Father, we pray in Your Name that You would come and You would speak through this content, through this message, through Your Word. You would speak through Your Word, the inspiration of Your Word the infallibility of the truth, that God, our lives would be changed. We would be transformed. We want to be transformed, Lord, regardless of whether this is our first Sunday or whether this is now a Sunday for 20 years where this has been much of the rhythm of our lives. We ask you to speak. Speak to our lives. Fill us with this belief and this view that we can live this kingdom life here in the 21st century. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. A couple of verses from last weekend to kind of frame what will be the content this weekend. Since we live by the Spirit, verse 25, Galatians 5, he says, let us now keep in step with the Spirit. And then he gives us the picture of how. He says in verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch though on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so to fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbour. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one, he says, who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit 
will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Okay, like the end of most of Paul's letters, today's remarks are somewhat a stream of consciousness. It's almost as if Paul is like coming toward the end of the ladder and goes, oh, I should have said, oh, I wish I'd have said, oh, I'm going to revisit and now say again. And so he throws out these series of somewhat disconnected statements here and there. And some of the statements actually appear almost contradictory. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. But he gives out these statements. Well, because of the series of these somewhat disconnected statements, it's really hard to package it into a nice and tight exegetical message outline. So what I want to do this weekend is I want to draw out three points, three big ideas, so to speak, of expressions of the Holy Spirit that look like when we're walking with God, when we're living and staying in step with the Holy Spirit, our lives look like this. The first one is found in verse 26. He says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. I'm convinced that if we were to survey churches, survey church leaders, survey maybe some denominational streams, there would be this broad spectrum of viewpoint as to what does the fullness of God look like in terms of the work of the Holy Spirit. On some extremes, you might have these extraordinary manifestations. On the other side, you might have these supernatural visitations of God. But what strikes me about the placement of verse 26 Directly below verse 25, 25, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, stay in step of the Holy Spirit. Verse 26, don't be conceited, is really what I believe is something of Paul is saying as to the maturity, the love, and the contribution of the Christian life. And here is what I see as the distinction. Paul is not speaking down about the signs and the wonders and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Just read much of his other writing. But yet in this context, he does say that when the Holy Spirit comes upon our lives, the Holy Spirit makes us holy, not weird. How many of you know that too many people that profess to be full of the Holy Spirit are full of something and you're not quite sure what it is? And you're like, you're just a little weird. I'm just going to tell you right now, maybe this is going to create tension, but you're weird. No, no, I'm full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't to make you a weird person, to make you a holy person. So much so, the first point. The first point, the Holy Spirit, the life of the Spirit, if you've got your app open, you can fill this in, looks like a new attitude. Looks like a new attitude. The word translated, do not be conceited, the word conceit means to be empty of honour. Well, none of us like to see conceit. We don't like to see a conceited person in the mirror, and we don't like, for sure, to see a conceited person in our relationships. Conceit is at some level, the ugliest underbelly of the pride-filled life. Narcissism, fixated on self, vanity, egotism. We don't like to see the underbelly of the pride-filled life. It's offensive. But what Paul says is conceit is to be empty of honour. Well, when you look at a conceited person, they want to project the persona of plenty where Paul actually says the conceited person is intentionally causing you to not see the emptiness of their life. Paul says this because of this issue. He's told us to be full of the Holy Spirit. If you're projecting this image of fullness and yet you're empty, you are not living in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You're living a mirage. You're living a fake life. And you're projecting this. So as much as it is offensive to be around a person that is conceited, it's almost as if what you need to do is you hear those words, but you go around through the back or the side door and you see the emptiness of the home where the projection is of this facade. It's a facade, but this projection that everything is fine. Paul says maturity is foundational to the Christian life. And from this place of maturity, he then creates this hypothetical situation in verse 1. He says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, the word caught there in some translations is the word overcome. 
and the word overcome in the original language speaks about a person that is surprised by a sin that enters their life. Okay, let's be real vulnerable now together. You haven't got to raise your hands if you know of someone that I'm thinking of now, but there are times in my life when I hear of a moral failure or a terrible sin or a crisis and I go, I'm not one bit surprised. As sad as that is to say, I'm not one bit surprised. That is not what this verse is saying. This verse is actually saying the opposite. When someone is overcome, that is you hearing of someone and you're like, no, not them. They did that? There's no way. And you're surprised. Paul is saying this is not the kind of person that sins with ease. This is the kind of person that really attempts and all that they can do to live the kingdom life. But something happened and he says, this is what you should do. He says, if this happens, verse one, you who are spiritual, Many women, invariably, all of us from one time or another will struggle with a sin struggle. But we will also see people drowning. The church, the role of the church is to swim towards those and throw the lifeline of grace towards those that are drowning. He says, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Point two, a life in the spirit positions us in the lives of others. A life Keeping in step with the Holy Spirit positions your life close to others. Why? For two reasons. Number one, to rescue people from their brokenness. To rescue people from their brokenness. You know, it's been said that the church is the only army that shoots her wounded. You've perhaps heard that phrase. And as sad as that phrase is, sometimes the church doesn't, quote, shoot the wounded. The church walks away and isolates the wounded. Those that are caught in sin, those that are bruised, those that are broken, those that are beaten up because of the wares of life, we isolate ourselves from them and that is the ugliness of the church and not the redemptive potential of the body of Christ. We shouldn't isolate those in sin, we should seek to restore them. The word restore speaks about putting a bone back into the socket because it's been displaced. Well, what Paul is saying is much in the physical body, there is pain when a bone is pulled from the socket in the same way in the body of Christ, when a bone is ripped from the socket, tendons and muscles, there is this pain that emanates throughout the entire body of Christ because of one person's sin. We should care about the spiritual well-being of others. We should care about it so much so Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, when one member suffers, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, we all suffer. We all suffer. Well, men and women, the church is unlike any organisation in the world. The church is not a rotary club. The church is not Kiwana's club. The church is not a club you join, but a family where you belong. It's also not a hotel where you swipe your card, pay your dues and sleep and spend time and then go home. It's a hospital where we see spiritual triage, where we come and have our vitals checked and we then grow, we are healed and we are sent from the hospital to the community to rescue others that are bleeding out. That's the role of the church. And remember, Paul is speaking to the church. He says, brothers, sisters, family, sons and daughters of God, you are not like the world. You live differently. You walk towards those that are suffering. Men and women, when we encounter people living in sin, it's a good job I'm not passionate about this content. When we encounter people living in sin, we should walk towards them. They don't need isolation. They need restoration. They need someone saying, I see more in you. This is not what God's made you to be. Some years ago, I met for coffee with a friend of mine. He was in the church at the time, has given me permission to share this story. And I knew of things that were going on in his life that were terrible. His wife had come to me. He himself had come to me. And he was in a situation where he was pursuing girls at work at the bar and had no intimate relationship with his wife at home, nor his kids. Things were struggling. He was done. He was tapping out. And we met for a cup of coffee. And let me tell you, that which I'm about to describe sounds more like busting someone's chops, but let me tell you, it has got to be appropriate to the person in front of you. But meet people for coffee when you learn of stories. We met for a cup of coffee and partway through the conversation, I was so done. I was like, my poop filter is full. I can't handle any more. 
And I was like, bro, this is not working for me. And so I ran across the table, a small round table. His arms are the size of my legs. And I was like, this is going to not end well. Pastor dies, counseling congregant in local coffee shop. Like, it's not going to end well. Well, I ran across the table and I threw my finger right into his chest. And I said, I'm so done with you. How about you stop trying to chase the skirt at the bar? How about you go home and love your wife so she wants to drop hers in front of you? How about you totally pursue her? How about you care for these kids? Quit trying to care for the kids of people, the girls that you're trying to act like you're also care. I was coming undone. I was reaching across the table. Apparently, I said, you've got to get your stuff together. He remembered a different S word, but I said, I think you've got to get your stuff together. I was so frustrated. Okay, now back up for a little bit. I'm not talking about being junior Holy Spirit but I am talking about caring for that which God is doing and caring for the spiritual well-being of others. Look people in the eye and say, I see more in you than you can currently see in yourself. You're destroying your life. You're destroying your family. Your kids are gonna not like you. This is not condemnation. This is me loving. This is compassion. Romans tells us it's the kindness of God that leads us to redemption and restoration and repentance. It's the kindness of God. But men and women, we're so happy to talk about people behind their back, but we're so unwilling to address them. Why? Because we think it's painful. We are permitting pain by not addressing pain. Say it. Say it kindly. Say it gracefully. We're the church. We're the people of God. We're not a rotary club. We're not a random club. We are God's people. So we walk towards and rescue those in brokenness. But point two, within that second big idea of others, we relieve people in their burdens. Look at verse two. It says, we must bear one another's burdens. He says, when we do, we are helping and we are fulfilling the law of Christ. In other words, when we throw our shoulder underneath somebody that the weight is too much and we help lift them up, we are fulfilling the law of Jesus Christ to love your neighbour as yourself. Verse 10, look what it says. As we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are in the household of faith. Men and women, when you live a mature life and a humble life, you don't see yourself as better or worse. You see yourself as one in the trenches of life. And you, in your humility, stand and are strong. Be strong. Strength is not the presence of pride. Strength is the presence of prayer. Be a man or a woman of God and stand and throw your shoulder and lift those that are struggling. This verse is actually a part of where there seems to be a contradiction. I wanna explain it to you. He says, bear one another's burdens. But then in verse five, he says, each though will have to bear his own load his own load. So which one is it? Do I help carry your stuff or do you carry it on your own? The answer is yes to both. There are two different words used here. Burden and load are different in our translation, but also very different in the original language. Burden would visually mean the carrying of 17 suitcases where load would be putting on a backpack, cinching it around your hip, pulling down the straps over your shoulders, and carrying your load. Here is what I believe that Paul is trying to say. You have a load and you should carry it. You also though will experience from time to time burdens that no one person could carry. And you are to determine that difference, but also so is the church. One of the takeaways here in this verse is this. Not everything that happens in your life is a spiritual 911 crisis. It's your stuff to carry. Don't blame your parents. Don't blame your kids. Don't blame whoever. Buck up and carry your load. But in the same way, there are burdens that no one can carry. And you're not expected to carry it. I want to play a game. I want to help you understand the, dis- the difference between load and burden. We're going to call it the, it's going to be like a TV show. We're going to get to engage and raise our hands. We're going to call it the loads and burdens game. Here we go. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand based upon what you think this is. Okay, so there is no judgment if we get it wrong from me, just from the person sitting next to you. Okay, a guy, a guy who spends all of his money on beer and lottery tickets and refuses to look for a job and then asks you for money to pay his bills. Is that our burden to bear? 
Or is it his load to carry? Raise your hand, his load to carry. Okay, we're one for one. Number two, your son who is living with you, a young and a strapping boy, constantly gets up late for work because he stays up playing video games, posting Snapchat and Instas all night. He asks you to wake him up every morning so that he does not lose his job. Is that our burden to carry? No, is it his load to bear? Yes, raise your hand, everyone broke their arm. Yes, okay. Number three, now we're gonna get a little bit more complicated. After getting his wife pregnant, a husband leaves his wife for another woman, leaving her with four kids to raise. She needs help meeting daily responsibilities and covering her financial debts for a while. Is that her load to bear? No, it's our burden to carry, isn't it? Last one, a married couple, and this one strikes close to home because of a recent situation. A married couple has three children and one day there is a tragic accident. One of the parents dies in the car wreck. The remaining parent of the kids, the remaining parent and the kids have needs. Is that our burden to carry? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. What I believe Paul is genuinely saying here is that there is a difference. He distinguishes between our loads that we should carry and our burdens that no one can carry. The church can err either side here. The church, if it continually gives itself to those that are not rightfully carrying that which is rightfully theirs to carry, the load, they sin. Because I believe that God gives us certain loads to carry. We're to carry them. We're to step up. In the same way, I think the church can err if it doesn't because of its diminishing capacity because of meeting loads when it fails to step up in real burdens. Here's the takeaway. I believe that Paul is saying to us, carry your stuff. Why? Because you're mature. How? Because you're spirit-filled. So as a spirit-filled person, be a mature person that carries your stuff and here's why. So that you have the capacity to help those that could never carry it on their own. That's the body of Christ. So what we do Here's the problem. Most people, or some certainly people, don't want to carry their load, so they appeal for help. And when the healthy people see the unhealthy people doing that, the healthy people that have a genuine burden say, I just don't want to be a burden. Men and women, the church, when we are healthy, there is nothing better in the world than the body of Christ. So walk towards others, walk towards others, serve and rescue and redeem. The last point, point three, a life in the Spirit invites us to live wholeheartedly. Look at verse six. Let the one who is taught the Word share all good things with the one who teaches. He then backs it up. He says, verse seven, don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. It's the sowing of our lives that determines the yield of our harvest. The farmer doesn't walk into the field on harvest day hoping for a greater yield than he knows to some degree he has sown some months earlier. You reap what you sow. He then goes on to say, verse 8, For the one who sows to his own flesh, this goes beyond financial generosity to every realm of life, The one who sows to his own flesh will reap corruption. Okay, what Paul is doing here is showing us this undeniable connection that is a principle in Scripture, the principle of creation, that there is this undeniable connection between that which you sow, you will harvest. Okay, I have had conversations with people about this very instance saying, well, I surrender my heart to Jesus in 2005, why is it now in 2008 that life is not perfect? Why? Because you are reaping what you sowed for 15 years prior to. And you go, oh, wait a minute. I read somewhere that Paul says, I am forgiven. The guilt of my sin has been paid for. All is well. Everything is right up until the last phrase. Your guilt is forgiven. But men and women, it is a principle of Scripture that we reap what we sow. Meaning, You are who you are today because of the choices you made yesterday. Yes, there's the miraculous realm here, but there is also the practical realm. You are who you will be. Who you are today will determine the person you are tomorrow. You reap what you sow, good and bad. Shame and guilt is gone 
but at times, consequences, God strengthens you in your consequences. And you say, so what's the takeaway? Well, there's an invitation. The invitation is, verse 8, so to the Spirit. So to the Spirit, and when you do, you will reap eternal life. This is similar to the imagery that Paul used in chapter 5, where he said the quality of fruit is determined by the depth of root. Plan your life. Plan your life in truth. Plan your life in relationships. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He says this, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. So do the Spirit today. So do the Spirit. And as you sow to the Spirit, and as you live with a new attitude in the environment of new relationships, Paul says, don't grow weary, verse 9. Keep doing good. Why? Because in due season, you will reap if you do not give up. Men and women, even when there is not a miracle story, even when the kids are not changed overnight, even when your marriage is not immediately restored, don't. Give up. Keep sowing to the Spirit. Keep believing God. Keep sowing. There is, I believe, a harvest for you, before you. It's true what the Scripture says. You will reap what you sow. Good, bad, and indifferent. The good sometimes takes years. Laura and I are in a chapter right now where we look back at the last 25 years of our lives and we see a lot of faithful sowing. And I'll tell you, I would love to walk in on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and start reaping the harvest. And you know what? I don't determine the harvest. I just determine the degree of sowing. Be faithful. Sow to the Spirit. Men and women, if you're currently sowing to your flesh, you will reap destruction. But when you sow to the Spirit, you will by the Spirit reap eternal life. I want to leave you with this final verse, verse 15. This entire letter builds this crescendo in verse 15. It says, Galatians 6, 15. What counts, come on now, what counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. That's what counts. Men and women, we believe throughout this region that the greatest miracle is the change of the human heart. What counts is whether we have been transformed. We believe that the transformation, the change, the miracle, the greatest miracle known to man is the changing of the human heart. To go from sowing to destruction, to sowing that of eternal life, from the flesh to the spirit. Men and women, sow to the Spirit in your life. Let's sow to the Spirit in Banning. Let's sow to the Spirit in Falcon. Let's sow to the Spirit in Braggate. Let's sow to the Spirit in our workplace. You go, I'm sowing, I'm sowing. Don't grow weary sowing, for you will reap the harvest. Will you stand with me? Here in just a moment, we are gonna celebrate that, which is the transformation of life. Mountain Springs, we believe in believers' baptism, meaning we don't baptize kiddos when they don't know what's going on. We baptize people when they have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And by profession of faith in Christ, we baptize. Baptism is the proclamation of the private profession. We're about to celebrate baptisms. Here at Mountain Springs, we celebrate them. We raise the roof. We celebrate the transformation. What counts? It's the transformation of life. Here also at Mountain Springs, we do something called spontaneous baptisms. We love it. There is nothing better than seeing somebody that came today with no plan to get baptized, but God is stirring your life. You are tired of sowing to the flesh and you wanna recoup, sow to the Spirit. And you're saying today, I wanna put my faith in Jesus Christ. There is nothing better in anything that we do than seeing someone enter the waters of baptism on the heels of putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that by faith, through grace, they receive Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord, and then they publicly declare before the church, I'm a new creation. I once was, but now I am by faith through grace. We're gonna celebrate. If you're here today and you say, I wanna spontaneously get baptised, I don't bring a spare change of clothes. We'll give you a towel. That's all we got, but we'll give you a towel. No Levi's, no shirt, 
no shorts, but we will totally deck you out with the best white towel you have ever seen. Come, respond, let's change our town. Come on, church, let's sing and celebrate, come on.